Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in a sort of makeshift studio in Maryland, and I'm talking to Phyllis Bennis from her home in Washington, D.C. Phyllis is the author of Ending the Iraq War, a primer, and she works for the Institute for Policy Studies. Thanks for joining us, Phyllis. Good to be with you, Paul. So, fellas, I'm going to start by playing you a, a segment of Barack Obama's speech uh, when he announced his plans for getting out of Iraq, uh, but I'm not sure he read your book. So let me say this as plainly as I can. By August 31st, 2010, our combat mission in Iraq will end. As we carry out this drawdown, my highest priority will be the safety and security of our troops and civilians in Iraq. So we will proceed carefully, and I will consult closely with my military commanders on the ground and with the Iraqi government. There will surely be difficult periods and tactical adjustments, but our enemy should be left with no doubt. This plan gives our military the forces and flexibility they need to support our Iraqi partners and to succeed. Initially, this force will likely be made up of 35,000 to 50,000 U.S. troops. Through this period of transition, we will carry out further redeployments. And under the Status of Forces Agreement with the Iraqi government, I intend to remove all U.S. troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. So we will complete this transition to Iraqi responsibility, and we will bring our troops home with the honor that they have earned. This is clearly a glass half full, glass half empty moment. And we do have to recognize that the transition from the reckless unilateralism and the reckless militarism morning, of the Bush years, the claim that going to war, war was the best thing that ever happened to this country, let alone the best thing that ever happened to Iraq, those days are over. And the fact that President Obama, whether he wanted to acknowledge the role of the peace movement or not, clearly was responding to the fact that the peace movement in these six years has succeeded in winning a huge anti-war consensus in this country. It was to that anti-war constituency that President Obama was speaking when he said, I intend to pull out all troops by the end of 2011. Now we know intention is not the same as commitment. We know that's not enough. But the fact that he had to say it is huge. It's absolutely huge. So what's wrong with that plan? The American troops keep enough troop levels there to, quote, keep our partners in good shape, um, keep a certain amount of stability, and, and then get out. What's wrong with that? Well, I think there's several things wrong with it, Paul. One has to do with what are the U.S. troops doing there? Are they bringing stability? The answer is no. The U.S. troops, the occupying troops, and they are occupying troops, whether the president is George Bush or Barack Obama, those troops are the cause of the violence. They are what spikes the violence. They are what gives reasons for the violence. So getting out is the first priority. And whether it's 16 months or 18 months, that's too long to begin with for ending the, quote, combat mission. The next problem is he says that a combat mission will end, but combat will not end. When you leave 50,000 troops on the ground in a volatile, warlike situation, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be combat. Now, you can say, well, they're not combat troops, but tell that to the dead Iraqis who will be killed by those troops when they are carrying out what will be called different kinds of operations. They will be called anti-terror operations or counterinsurgency operations. They won't be called combat operations, but they will involve combat. So that's a serious problem. He didn't even this time say that all combat troops would be out. He said combat brigades, which is an even narrower category because it means all of these troops can be remissioned, as they call it, given a new mission with a, a different name, or relabeled. So assistance is the new label for combat troops. They're no longer a combat troop because they're not called a combat troop. So there's a lot of problems. He places a great deal of emphasis on creating a regional solution to the Iraq uh, oh, crisis. He talks about even involving Syria and Iran. Um, is he not trying to, first of all, can the U.S. get out without achieving certain strategic objectives in Iraq? And is he not trying to create some kind of regional uh, set of jigsaw puzzle of, a, of an alliance 
that allows the U.S. to get out and still maintain a certain amount of power in the region, because it's hard to imagine how the U.S. can simply walk from its dominance. I have every view that the U.S. is not intending to walk away from its dominance. Unfortunately, I don't think that President Obama's carefully chosen words are going to turn out to be precisely accurate. I don't think that all U.S. troops are going to be out of Iraq by the end of 2011. I know he said he intends that, and he may well even believe that, but I don't think he's going to be able to pull it off. Not because U.S. troops are needed to keep the peace. They are not keeping the peace. They are causing the war. But because the, the scenario in the region, as well as inside Iraq, is as volatile as it is, because U.S. interests are as profound and powerful there as they are relative to oil, relative to military bases. You know, it's interesting that the one key word we did not hear in this speech was bases. No commitment to end the bases, to close the bases. Well, I don't if believe... If you pull all had... troops out by 2011, you have to close the bases. And I think the Iraqi, well, the withdrawal, what the Iraqis call the withdrawal agreement, I think is pretty clear right. that the bases have to be that closed. The, the SOFA agreement, the what the Iraqis call a, a withdrawal agreement, is very clear. It's clear that all the troops must be out by the end of 2011, and it's clear that all the bases have to be closed and turned over to the Iraqis. I know that's clear. I know that President Bush signed it. I also know that it was not brought to the, to the Senate for ratification, as is required by our Constitution. I know that it was passed by and ratified by the Iraqi parliament after great struggle on the part of the parliamentarians against the Maliki government who did not want to allow the, the parliament to take it up, precisely because the parliament didn't strengthen it. It was the parliament, not the Maliki government, that demanded that there be language saying all troops, that there be specific language about the mercenaries and contractors who also were not mentioned yeah. in President Obama's speech. This is going to be a serious problem because I think we know what that agreement requires, but we also know the history of the United States in violating its own agreements. And in this one, I have no doubt that they will be able to go to the Iraqi government and say, you know what, we need you to ask us to stay long. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington is a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matter. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system.
We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.